So now everybody knows why I love Chris Canfield so very much. <laughs> Our next storyteller tonight was going to be Lana Bartlett, uh, who is a world-class storyteller and one of the founders of the North Carolina Storytelling Guild. Uh, but Lona had a very serious illness in her family and called me about it just a couple of days ago. Uh, so I'm going to tell a story on very short notice uh, to you tonight to take Lona's place. Um, I've kind of used up all of the criminal stuff that I've done, uh, <laughs> except for the part that I can't pass on at the moment. I'm not sure about statutes, so let me tell you. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about my father. My father was a distant father. He was standoffish and strict and not a knee dandler or a lap sitter. Uh, and so I never really felt very close to my father. And then one night I was lying in bed. I think I was probably six. And my dad came in and sat down on the edge of the bed and said, Boy, I'll tell you a story tonight. He'd never done that before. I said, great. He said, well, you see, there was this very brilliant scientist who was an engineer. Well, my dad was a scientist and an engineer. <laughs> and he said, and there was this little boy who lived in the neighborhood who thought he was brilliant and couldn't get enough of him, always came around to see him in his lab. And one day the little boy came to see the brilliant scientist and the brilliant scientist said, I've got a surprise for you. And they walked over to this strange, round enclosure, like a space capsule, and they climbed inside. The brilliant scientist and the little boy shut the door, and the brilliant scientist began flipping switches and turning knobs and turning dials, and lights started blinking, and the little boy looked out the porthole, and he says, holy cow, the world is getting bigger and bigger. And the brilliant scientist said, no, we're getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> And they got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until they were about the size of a BB. And then off they took on a little tour of the laboratory. And they flew over next to the window, which the little boy thought was clear. But when they got up close to it, it was streaky and blotchy and had little seeds in it. And it was, hard. It was not very transparent at all. And then they settled down into the soil under a potted plant, an African violet there on the windowsill. And the African violet stems were ginormous. And here came a spider, three times bigger than their ship. The little boy was terrified, and the brilliant scientist said, don't worry about it. Spiders don't eat shrinking ships. <laughs> And after a little while, they explored the rest of the lab, and then they flew back out over the landing pad on the floor, and the brilliant scientist set the little BB thing down, and they grew back up to full size. And my dad said, well, I think that's about enough for tonight. And so I rolled over and went to sleep. A couple of nights later, my dad came back and he said, you want to hear the next episode of the Brilliant Scientist and the Shrinking Ship? And I said, oh, please. My goodness, yes, I want to hear that story. And my dad said, okay. Well, the next time the little boy came to see the Brilliant Scientist, they got in the ship. This time there was a lab assistant available in the room, you know. Brilliant scientists often have lab assistants. And so they got into the ship, 
and they began shrinking again. And this time the little boy wasn't quite so freaked out about it because he'd been there before, and they got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then they flew over to the lab table and settled on a little coaster, like a petri dish. And the lab assistant came over and set a little bell jar over the top of the petri dish. And it turned out that they had landed on a Lincoln penny in the petri dish. And the brilliant scientist shrank them down, 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 down. And they sailed over and landed in Lincoln's eye. And then they shrank smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And ever, ever so much smaller. And finally, they landed on the nucleus of a copper atom. And there in the sky, whirling overhead, were 29 suns orbiting the nucleus of the atom. Enough to keep the sky brightly lit all the time. And there on the planetary surface of the copper nucleus, 29 protons and 30-something neutrons, they saw, and my dad said, I think that's about enough for tonight. <laughs> we'll take this up another night. And I said, are you kidding me? He said, no, let's wait. We'll, we'll wait. You can think about what you think they saw. And then he went on out of the bedroom and shut the door. Well, I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And one night went by, and two nights went by, and three nights went by, and four nights went by, and a week went by, and then two weeks went by, and I went to Dad and I said, when are you going to tell me the rest about the story, about the, the shrinking ship and, the, and the, the, the brilliant scientist and the little boy and, and Lincoln Vine? And he said, not tonight, I've got papers to bring. <laughs> Or not tonight, it's football night. And this went on until I gave up. And then I sat down and I wrote the story on one of those big pads with the blue lines, with the blue lines, with the dotted lines in between the blue lines, with a pencil the size of a log. I wrote the whole story, but as far as I could remember it. And I took it to my dad and I said, this story, are you going to finish this story? And he looked at it, he read through it, and he says, son, I don't recognize any of this. <laughs> I said, this is your story. You told me this story and I want you to finish it. He said, I never told you this. I don't know where you got this. You've got a quite an active imagination there. And then he put it on the corner of his desk. And it sat there for a long time, and then it just sort of disappeared. Well, my dad was a distant man, but he had other virtues. As far as I could tell, is where he lived 100% of the time that he wasn't out of the house. And if you ask him any question, any question at all, he would grab that pad of paper and pick it up and start drawing pictures. Well, many years after the episode of the shrinking ship, many years, I think I was probably in the first grade by now, maybe the second grade, I went to my dad and I said, so what, what's this about sex? I've been hearing about sex and I don't know anything about it. You wanna tell me about sex? And as he always did, he grabbed that pad of paper. <laughs> and he grew a little bee cell, a little bee egg, and then he grew a little bee sperm. <laughs> and then he grew some uh, additional anatomical information that we informed you about how they got together. And at some point, I'm, 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 I'm looking at anatomically correct stick figures <laughs> in various positions. <laughs> 
And I said, that is the most amazing thing I ever heard my whole life. <laughs> but I knew that if my dad drew it on the pad, it was real. So I said, can I keep that piece of paper? I mean, a lot of people in sixth grade, I mean, first grade, first grade, a lot of six-year-olds want to see this stuff. <laughs> and my dad said, no, son, that is for grown-ups. That is the business of grown-ups. And I said, okay. So that was when I was six. A long time later, I graduated from high school. And the summer I graduated from high school, I got a job at my dad's lab. He was no longer a college professor, now he was an independent consultant. He had a laboratory. And the guys in dad's lab had, uh, they, they all dressed alike. They were funny looking people. They had bow ties because they couldn't get their long ties tied up and you know, messed up in the experiments. And they all wore slide rules about that long hanging off their sides here. And uh, they had pocket protectors. And about half of them smoked pipes. And about, and the other half had mustaches. It was kind of this thing that were there for their family. They were just a funny looking bunch of guys. And they had been contracted to develop something called a vortex gun. Now to this day, I have no idea why they were hired to develop a vortex gun or who contracted with them to do it. But they had successfully developed a vortex gun. How many people in here know what a vortex is? Okay, that's half of you. Y'all do this. The other half, a vortex is a donut of air that spins around itself like this and maintains continuity. You can make one by taking a plastic milk jug and cracking the side real hard like that. And then this invisible donut of air goes shooting out and you can put out a birthday candle with it. Well, my dad and his friends had developed a vortex gun that was very powerful and it was a tube of steel about seven or eight feet long and about this big in diameter and it sat on a little lab cart and had wires and tubes and, and equipment and, and connections and flashing lights and this thing looked like something right out of Lost in Space. <laughs> and you could turn the thing on and it would go and then somebody would push the button and it would go boom. <laughs> and then down at the other end of the lab about 20 seconds later a Webster's Dictionary standing on its edge would fall over. <laughs> well, as you can imagine, this kept those guys entertained for 30 minutes or so. And then they needed better, something better to do with that Vortex gun. Then somebody had a brilliant idea. All the way at the end of the hall, my dad's office is down at this end of the hall, all the way at the other end of the hall, there is an attorney's office. And down there at the attorney's office, the receptionist door stood open and the receptionist sat in profile to the door. And so one night when she was at home, they set up the vortex gun. <laughs> and this is how it worked. They would turn it on and get it warmed up first thing in the morning before anybody was around. They'd go, and then it'd just sit there all charged up, ready to go. <laughs> and then when the time was right, they'd slip over and the, the, their door was big and heavy but had a little glass window on about that big and they'd open the door and fire. <laughs> Close the door. And then here's five or six grown men 
with pocket protectors and slide rules and bow ties and mustaches and pipes trying to get their heads looking through that little window and they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting and then down at the end of the hall the receptionist's hair would go whoo <laughs> Well, you've never seen anything funnier than five or six grown engineers falling on the floor, <laughs> slapping and laughing and so silly. But what they did after that was they launched a program of terrorism against that poor receptionist. They would launch a vortex at her. Five minutes, two hours, 30 seconds, two days. She was going nuts. She thought the office was haunted. She began to have this tremor. Uh, she was sitting there trying, trying to take take notes on the phone and <laughs> she's just barely able to hold a receiver. And then, and then one day she called him. And it was beautiful to see. She came stomping down the hall. Slammed open the door. There's all these engineers on the floor. They got up. And she says, you people owe me an apology. My dad, being the head guy, said, we're sorry. <laughs> and she said, that's it? You're sorry? And my dad said, well, we're very sorry. <laughs> and she said, that is just not good enough. You're going to take me out to lunch. My dad said, okay. And she said, to Julian's. Now, Julian's was the most expensive restaurant in Nashville. My father had never taken my mother to Julian's. <laughs> and he said, okay. At this point, I was all in. I mean, at this point, I'm a junior engineer. I'm ready to go. So the big day came, the day came when we were all gonna go to Julian's for lunch, and I'm just as excited as I can be, and I've gotten all dressed up, and I've you know, got my best blue jeans on, not like I do tonight, and, and, I, and I'm ready to go. And we all get up to the front desk, and we're getting ready to go out to lunch, and, and my dad said, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm going to lunch at Julian's. He said, no, son, this is the business of grown-ups. <laughs> Second time in my life I've heard that. Well, I graduated from high school and went off to college. And my dad and I were never really close. Uh, never emotionally tight and several times uh, over the years since I worked in conservation right right up until his last year on earth my dad would say things like when are you going to get a real job and then three or four years ago my dad died and between us, we never finished the story about the brilliant scientist and the little boy. That story never got told in its final form. And so the brilliant scientist and the little boy are still stuck in Lincoln's very sad eye. All right. <laughs>